You're listening to the Hello Awesome Podcast, and this is episode number 66. Today, I have a special treat for you guys. I am talking with a very good friend of mine, Tiffany Anderson. She and her husband, Aaron, are missionaries to Brazil. And when we recorded this podcast episode, it was actually before Christmas. So I'm a little bit behind getting it to you. Um, I was looking for the right spot uh, to place it because I love our conversation so much. And actually, with everything going on in the world today, it is kind of fitting what we were talking about. We actually dive into how God unfolded the calling for Tiffany and for Aaron to go to Brazil as missionaries. We talk about serving other people regardless of our feelings, waiting on the Lord, and how our God is a global God. I think you guys are going to really be blessed by this conversation. If you feel like you've been called to missionary work or if you ever feel like God is calling you to anything at all, what Tiffany has to tell you will bless you as well. I just know it. Re-listening to this episode really touched my heart. And I just have a couple of things to announce. Aaron and Tiffany are expecting their first child any day now. They are actually here in the States waiting on the Lord for their new bundle of joy and also for um, just orders when they can return back to Brazil because it is such a difficult time with the COVID-19 and also with um, just the way that the world is right now. Um, They haven't returned yet to Brazil, so they are here in the States. However, they do um, have plans to go back. So at the end of this episode, Tiffany gives us a number where we can donate through text message. So I'm just going to tell you again right now because I just want to clarify how you can do it. So you can donate to the evangelism fund that they have for Brazil. This doesn't just help Tiffany and Aaron. This helps all of the brothers and sisters who are on the field with them, this evangelism fund will go to build churches and will go to feed those in need in the cities that they are working in. So if you want to just write this down quickly so that you can donate, text capital A, capital A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. So that's two A's to the number 71777. And then you click on the evangelism tab when the option comes up on your phone. And that is probably the quickest way that you can donate to the missionaries of Brazil. And that goes into an evangelism fund for all of the work that they need to do. Guys, I know that this world right now is in a very dark place, but we have hope in Jesus. And I think that this episode came at the perfect time where we talk about serving other people where we talk about learning to understand them and how to meet a need the way Jesus would want us to meet it. Okay, guys, this is episode number 66 that I am calling Mission Minded with Tiffany Anderson. Hey, guys, I'm JC. Are you ready for real conversations about faith, business, and life? Me too. This is the Hello Awesome podcast where I bring forth topics and truthful insights That will encourage you to make intentional choices and pursue God with your whole heart. Are you ready to say hello to the awesome blessings that God has for you? All right, let's do this. Summer is upon us and what better way to celebrate than with some sweet deals. I have an amazing group of business ladies who have sponsored the podcast and they have a treat just for Hello Awesome listeners. My friend Chantel, a two-time podcast guest, runs the very successful modest fashion clothing brand, Nuggles. Aiming to always provide beautiful, comfortable, and affordable apparel, Nuggles desires every lady to embrace modesty with style. You don't have to break the bank or sacrifice that morning latte when you shop with Nuggles. In fact, Hello Awesome listeners can use the exclusive 10% off discount code by using Hello Awesome 10 during checkout. Head to Nuggles.us to browse their full collection today. Again, that's N-U-G-G-L-E-S dot U-S to shop high quality products to add to your modest wardrobe right now. Do you find yourself struggling to find a durable scrunchie that's both functional and cute? Seriously, look no further than So Vita. Guys, I am not lying when I say that I use Lucy's scrunchies every single day and my hair reaches behind my knees. So Vita is a handmade shop with beautiful and fun scrunchies, headbands, and more. 
Use coupon code PODCAST for 10% off your order right now at Sovita.com. That's S-E-W-V-I-D-A.com. Go grab a few goodies this summer and keep your hair off your neck with style. Be sure to also follow Lucy on Instagram at Sovita. Are you looking for classic modest pieces for your summer wardrobe? My girl Mandy over at Blue Thistle Taylor has timeless dresses, skirts, and handbags. Last year, it was such a treat to meet Mandy during General Conference in Indiana, and I truly feel like we're soul sisters. I love her passion for simplistic modesty, and you will too. Just use our special code HelloAwesome for 20% off your order on BlueThistleTaylor.com. That's B L U. T-H-I-S-T-L-E-T-A-I-L-L-U-E-R dot com. Also give her a follow on Instagram at Blue Thistle Taylor. I don't know about you, but I struggle to find quality skincare products with simple ingredients that don't irritate my skin, especially in these hot summer months. Well, Rachel over at Oneness Essentials makes handmade soap and body products that not only look and smell beautiful, but they're perfect for sensitive skin like mine. I seriously can't wait to try her Cocoa Cream Lotion. It sounds like it smells amazing. Use code HelloAwesome for 15% off your order when you shop at OnenessSoapBiz.com. That's O-N-E-N-E-S-S-S-O-A-P. Biz.com. Make sure to also follow Oneness Soap Biz on Instagram for gorgeous product photos and updated business info. So when I think of summer, I think of hanging out by the shore and strolling along little shops, browsing at the adorable clothing that I just can't afford. Can you relate? Well, you don't have to worry about that with Dress Like an Angel. Felicia is a pastor's wife and mama of two beautiful daughters who has been selling clothing for 30 years now. Wow, this woman of God is the ultimate mama boss. Felicia's shop, Dressed Like an Angel, features stunning dresses, skirts, extenders, layered tops, and so much more in a variety of styles while highlighting the beauty of modesty. She even carries items for young girls like her best-selling lace tights. If you live near Starks, Louisiana, stop by their brick and mortar store that's filled with adorable, gorgeous clothing. Or use our exclusive discount code HelloAwesome for 10% off your order at DressLikeAnAngel.com. Keep up with their huge inventory selection and future sales by following Dress Like an Angel on Instagram. Hey everybody, we are back with the Hello Awesome podcast and I have a very dear friend of mine here with me today. Tiffany Anderson is married to Aaron Anderson, who I had the privilege of getting to know one summer 10 years ago as he and a few friends came to study under my pastor Clifford Readout. Now Tiffany and Aaron are married and they serve as missionaries in the beautiful country of Brazil. Tiffany, thank you for taking time away from the mission field to chat with us today. Can you share more about who you are and what you do? Well, um, my name is Tiffany Anderson. As you said, I'm 31 years old and I grew up in San Diego, California, but I feel like I kind of had a mix of cultures around the U.S. because my dad is from the Midwest. My mom's from the South. He's from Indianapolis. My mom's from Tennessee. And they were ministers, so I grew up in a minister's home, and we always traveled a lot. They were both teachers, so we took about a month's road trip, a road trip for about a month every summer during, you know, summer break. And I'm really thankful for that because I feel like it exposed me to a lot of different cultures within the United States, not just in the region, but also in the church as well because every church has its own culture every district has its own culture its way of doing things what's normal for that place you know and I think that exposure really prepared me for you know going international but also for when you're a missionary you have to go back on deputation you visit tons of different kinds of churches tons of different kinds of districts and um, that's how I grew up Um, also 
I have a secular degree from SDSU, San Diego State University, where I studied for four years. And I went to Indiana Bible College for two years, and I got a two-year bachelor, um, which that really ended up coming into God's plan because you would think the secular degree, everyone jokes around like, oh, you know, a Bible college degree isn't accredited. It doesn't really count or anything like that. But when we had to get residency for Brazil, you know, which one actually counted for our residency was they wanted proof that we studied theology through our organization. So we had to show our IBC diplomas, me and Aaron, that we both graduated. Um, and that ended up being a miracle. Wow. So that ended up being totally God's will for us to go to IBC and both graduate. Um, we married in 2011. We were both 22 years old. We got married, and then we youth pastored for two years in California, Temecula, California. Um, and with the blessing of our pastor, we came as Amers to Brazil in 2013. And the rest is history. We've been missionaries here, you know, working in mission since 2013. So seven, you know, six years going on seven years. And we live in Sao Paulo. In Brazil, which is the largest city in the Southern Hemisphere. It's one of the top 10 largest cities in the world. There's about 23 million people in our metro area. Um, so there's never been a church inside the city limits of Sao Paulo, this huge, huge city. And that's what me and my husband are working on right now. Wow. That is a lot of people. Um, <laughs> incredible. I love your story. I really do. And it was funny because when Aaron was here for that summer, um, you know, he would mention, oh, yeah, Tiffany this and Tiffany that. So you were definitely on his mind. Um, but uh, it's really awesome that you mentioned IBC uh, yeah. about how that must have been being that you guys are still getting to know each other, plus doing school there. So yeah. I wanted to know, was the burden for mission work? mutual did it start there with one of you and then the other one had to kind of pray a little bit more about it how did that work out yeah well um talking to Aaron you know he when you talk to him he's always kind of known even as a little kid people like missionaries would come through and say like he's gonna be a missionary one day and you know he has this little he had this little stubborn streak where it's like no I'm not gonna be a missionary and then later on while we were at IBC he told me up front when things were getting serious in our relationship, Tiffany, I think I'm going to be involved in missions one day. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? And from my side of the story, um, I've always, growing up, my parents both moved away from their parents, our cousins, aunts, uncles, everyone, for the sake of ministry. And so I kind of grew up just thinking, oh, when I get married one day, I'm just going to move wherever my husband feels called like that. I just, I didn't think I was going to live where my parents lived. I just didn't think that I thought I was going to move away because mm -hmm. that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So I already had it in my, my, you know, way of thinking and in myself, this plan that, okay, I'm going to follow my husband wherever he goes. And actually when people have asked me, you know, well, you know, have you felt it? When did you feel a call to missions? I almost felt a little embarrassed for a while explaining like well you know I just like follow my husband but actually a few months ago um, me and Aaron were able to attend sister Howell's funeral you know our global missions director's wife mm -hmm. who passed away recently and he brother Howell had written a beautiful letter in memory of her written to her and it was read by their daughter Amy at the funeral and they said and she said this she said um, in the letter, Brother Hal wrote, people used to ask you if you had a call to go to the mission field. You always said, I married him, pointing at me, and promised to follow him for the rest of my life. And when I heard that in the funeral, I was like, I felt a relief, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> because I felt like, wow, like following my husband is, is literally my calling. His calling is my calling. And I don't need to be embarrassed about this. This explanation is enough, you know, that you follow your husband. What he's called to do is your call. And so we honestly went in together 
100% together. Luckily, thank God. I know it's not always like that for every couple going on the mission field or having a big change in their life. Um, but we were on the same page and he was really upfront about it before we got married. So I knew before we got married that it was a definite mm -hmm. possibility. <laughs> yeah. Which thank you, Lord, that you have an honest man already, um, yes. <laughs> opening up about that. Um, cause mm -hmm. you never know. Some guys might feel like it might be something not even worth talking about cause it may not happen or they right. don't feel like it's going to be a big deal. Um, right. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And I love how uh, that was said. And I can't even imagine um, the pressure it would have felt on you to say, yeah, I have the same calling when you you're not sure, you know, um, yeah. it, it's right. not like you had that, you know, the the voice from heaven sound. <laughs> right, down. right. Cause you, yeah, you hear these stories all the time about like, I had a dream, I had a vision, I had a Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not like that for everybody. I know Aaron sometimes preaches, you know, sometimes it's not a burning bush moment. Sometimes it's a Nehemiah calling where you mm -hmm. see the walls need to be built and you go, this needs to happen. Let's go do it. You know, mm -hmm. and it's different for everybody. Everybody's calling is different. It's definitely been God's will, but um, we didn't have a burning bush moment. A lot of times it is that prompting of the Holy Ghost that you just feel like in yourself, like this is, this is right. This is what we need to do. Right. And that's when, you know, your own personal devotion with God is important because there's yes. going to be different ways that he's going to speak to you. Exactly. And um, that kind of leads me into the next question, which is probably a very loaded question, but I mm -hmm. want to know if you can give me an example of one moment when you really felt like especially in the beginning stages of this as you're becoming a missionary and you're going to brazil where mm -hmm. you felt like trusting god was literally all you could do like it was all that you could yeah. do in the moment yes well um before we became aimers you know we both gave up our jobs and some well-meaning people you know i worked at a school they were like you know why you know aaron, but aaron felt once again following your husband's leading he felt, you know, we need to go for six months. Like, I really feel like we need to go for six. And it was our first time ever coming to Brazil. We'd never been to Brazil, never knew anybody. We hadn't met anyone in Brazil. Um, and so it was a big step of faith. Well, we, we some well-meaning people said, you know, just take the summer off, see if you like it, all of that. Well, we went for the six months and it was actually in that six month that God uh, really called us. But saying all that, I gave up and Aaron gave up financial stability, obviously to be an aimer, mm -hmm. because as an aimer, it's literally whatever offering you can get, whatever money you can scrape up is what you're living off of. And, um, so for the first three years, three or four years of being aimers before we went on deputation at the end of 2017. So between 2013 and the end of 2017, four years basically than as Amers. We didn't have jobs. And while we lived here, we lived on a very, very tight budget of probably about, just being totally upfront with you, of about $1,000 a month, which mm. is not, a, uh, not very much. Yeah. So we, um, there were times, a few times, one time in particular, we did not have any money at all. We had like literally no money that month, not even a thousand dollars. And we were just thinking like, okay, Lord, like, you know, we have to trust that when the money runs out, maybe that's when we need to go home, you know, for a little while. And we were praying and, um, Aaron in particular was, was praying. And while he was praying about this thousand dollars we needed, he got, a an email out of the blue from an evangelist we had met like one time a year before, like the, the year before. We never talked to this evangelist. He wasn't like a close friend or anything like that. We didn't tell our parents or anyone that we needed money. Um, mm -hmm. We just kept it between ourselves. And the, in, in the email was a PayPal link for a thousand dollars. And he just said, I felt in my heart, you know, today in prayer that I needed to send this thousand dollars to you. Hope you guys need it. Hope it's a blessing. And we were like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what we needed. <laughs> and it just, it just boosted our faith, you know, because um, 
the thing is when you obey God, you can't just be crazy and just go, you know, totally sell everything, leave everything, just, you know, just be completely irrational without God speaking to you. But if you really feel like you're obeying God and you are obeying God, you're opening doors for God to actually do miracles in your life. Because if our hands are on the wheel, how is God supposed to step in and do something for us yeah. if we're in control, you know? So I was, we, we, that just boosted our faith. Like, wow, we're still supposed to be here. Yeah. That's incredible. And it's funny too, because when we did go to general conference this past year, there were yeah. so many stories about that coming across the pulpit. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because when we hear those stories, we're encouraged, but it's right. even more encouraging when it literally happens to us in moments yes. we're not expecting. Right. It's, that's when it's real. We're like, oh, mm -hmm. right. He is control of this whole thing here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I want to talk about the actual field because I think a lot of us, especially here in the States, we get this like fantasy like thoughts about foreign missions. And, yes. you know, they're not bad thoughts, but they're just maybe embellish in a way like you know like it's a you know a movie or something but you guys are living it every day like this is your real life and yeah. I want to know what has been maybe one of the biggest surprises to you by far well I mean honestly it's it's real life like you said I mean you know when you're younger maybe when you're new in the ministry or anything even people romanticize not just missions field but ministry in general you know like oh, I'm going to sacrifice everything I'm going to give it all you know yeah. and you're crying and you mm -hmm. know it's not nosed at the altar crying before the lord and in the end though it's consistency in real life and you pay your bills you have a budget you wash the dishes you have sad days you have good days um but probably the biggest surprise, I guess, um, would probably be um, cultural, uh, probably the biggest cultural adjustment, I'll say, is just needing to have patience in another country. Mm -hmm. Things are a lot more bureaucratic in South America. So whenever I hear people complain about like, so, so you know, you might imagine a missionary is going to be you know, they're over there digging wells and stuff. And that happens, you know, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but sometimes just living life takes more time in the mission field. So mm -hmm. for instance, to go to the DMV, I hear people complain about the DMV in, the Amer in North America, in the United States. And I think you have no idea. You have no idea <laughs> because here, you know, they'll be like, I waited two or three hours at the DMV in the United States. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's annoying. You had to wait. But here, you, we had to go three different days, travel 40 minutes to the DMV, get in line, wait the whole day. And we had to do that for like three different days because they send you, you know, your eye exam isn't going to be there in the DMV. They send you to another eye exam doctor that's authorized by the government to go wait there, get that paper you need. And then, you know, okay, you can't pay your fee at the DMV either. You have to go to this special bank, get that receipt. So it's like a lot more steps in everything you do. Mm -hmm. And so that's real life. That's real life on the mission field is just even going grocery shopping, going and just getting stuff done just the day to day. We are in the United States. Things are so convenient, so mm -hmm. convenient. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's built into our culture. You know, if something's not convenient, we're, you know, we're upset. But here in another country, if you get upset, it just shows you're American. It's like, you need to calm down because no one else here in this line is upset but you. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is so true. I mean, it really is. And I've heard that from many people who have gone to different countries and maybe have served in um, whether it was AIM or what's the other one there? I can't remember. Um, um, like Associate Missionaries Next Steps. Yeah, like they've gone to serve for like a summer and they've come back and they're like, wow, right. guys, we are really spoiled. And true. Um, I think about that too. And I always like to try and keep that in the back of my mind. You know, um, it's so easy no matter where you are to get frustrated at the culture of that place. But then yeah. re realizing that other cultures, other places have it way harder than you or things are just a little bit less convenient. And yes, less convenient. We really have it good. And I feel that way too when I see the news and I see so many people complaining. And I'm like, hey, 
they're actually letting you complain in public. Some places yes. they don't even let you open your mouth. So exactly. we're blessed in America. Exactly. I have to say. For sure. So this will be a good time too to, to put the spotlight on serving, you know, being mm-hmm. a servant. And I think, honestly, I think being a missionary is the ultimate act of service um, to mankind because you're really serving somebody else that you may not even understand. And, um, you know, taking care of somebody else's needs uh, many times Mm -hmm. before your own. Mm -hmm. So what has the mission field taught you about serving others? Um, I would just say that you can't go off of your feelings. You can't go off of your feelings. You can't live off of your feelings. There's times you're tired. There's times you're lonely on the mission field. There's times you're uninspired, maybe. You're kind of reaching that dry place where you're like, Lord, I'm always praying for people. Like, honestly, I'm just going to be totally honest. When I go back to the United States, I love when people pray for me. I love when people come and lay hands on me and start praying for me because sometimes you're on the mission field and you don't have people coming up and praying for you because you're the one praying, you know, they probably feel um, awkward or kind of like, this is rude for me to come pray for the missionary. You know, I'm assuming that's, that's the case, you know, but I love it when I go back and I feel prayers because I I miss it being on the mission field. And so you can't go off of these times when you feel lonely, discouraged. You have to continue to serve and realize that, hey, I got to get out of my own bubble, out of my own world Mm -hmm. and realize there's someone that has it way worse than me right here that needs my help. And there's something bigger than myself. Um, So I would just say, um, I have to get back to the source in those moments when I'm feeling dry. And, and, um, I loved this, this quote by someone recently who said, the Holy ghost is the source. It's your source. It's not a resource. And, um, and it's so true. Like we have to get back to the source when we're feeling that, especially to serve. Cause you can't just go out of your own self. You have to rely on the Holy ghost back to the source. Yeah. I love how you put that. It's true. I wouldn't even have thought about you know, here again, we probably do get spiritually spoiled here because we yeah. just have a lot more people to, you know, if we need a touch, they'll come and pray over us. But over there, you're the one that's giving and you're the one that's kind of pouring out, you know, to these people that really need God. And mm-hmm. that is an interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up because it really keeps it just in a real perspective. Yes. Um, you know, you're humans. And yes. Yes. Yes, you're serving other human human needs, and mm-hmm. uh, we definitely need to remember that the Holy Ghost is our source because God's the only one that can fill us up when we have no more to give. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, I have a question, and I would love your input on it. Yes, and it might be, you know, uh, uh, again, another loaded question, but what is your definition of being mission minded? Um, I just try to think of being mission minded as being globally minded, like being a global Christian and realizing, um, once again, you know, we, I'm thankful for the United States. I'm an American. I'll always be an American. I'm blessed to be an American, but sometimes we forget that we are only about 4% of the world's population, like over 95% of the world is not American. Mm -hmm. And they do things differently. They have a different culture, um, you know, and they need to hear the gospel. And sometimes we have to just remember, you know, it's not just what's in our, in our backyard, in our world. And it's so, I mean, and and thank God for me, I'm not trying to say like, you should not focus on America, American churches, North American um, home missions. All of that is so important. But I think of missions minded as just being globally minded and just remembering like, wow, I have so many brothers and sisters out there. And sometimes our trials, you know, like we were talking about how we're blessed. Sometimes our trials are first world problems. And there's our brothers and sisters who are in access challenge nations that we need to be praying for and that are going through literal life and death Mm -hmm. situations because of the gospel. And um, I think just to remembering that we are uh, that the church is not just America. 
you know, or God is not American, <laughs> that it is yeah, right. <laughs> global. It's the mm-hmm. whole, yeah, it's the whole world. It's the whole gospel for the whole world. This was something that I had thought about. I'm glad you, you touched on that because um, when I came into the church, I was uh, in my early 20s. And so I had already experienced, you know, 22 years of life. And so when I uh, received the gift of the Holy Ghost and I started studying in the Word, it was very clear to me that God is a global God. Yes. And it just made sense that if He was to fill us with His Spirit, we wouldn't just be speaking English. Right. And when you really just simplify that, it, mm-hmm. it just makes everything just make more sense. And when he is doing a work um, yeah. and when he's speaking to people, it can be in any language. And he's just trying to connect with creation. Yes. And I really, I really appreciate you saying that. When you come back to the States, and I know you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but how does it feel to see the contrast between back home and Brazil? Yeah, one of the biggest differences I see, and it's, a, it's not a pro or a con, and there's pros and cons to both of these things, anything in culture is, um, is that Brazil is a lot of times more relaxed about a lot of things, um, which is a pro and a con. It's pro because you're relaxed and people don't get upset as often about certain things we would get upset in America about. Um, They, you know, but sometimes it lacks certain organization and structure that we are used to in the United States. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's good that we're always trying to improve things, but with that, I feel like is a perfectionistic kind of pressure we always feel to be like almost perfect. Like I get so Mm -hmm. nervous having to talk in public in the United States. I don't know. I think it's because I feel more pressure to be perfect in the United States. When I come back to Brazil, they're just like so excited you're there and it doesn't matter if you mess up. And it's just, you know, they're just so forgiving. It's just, so I just feel the pros and cons in both cultures in that way, because the, the pro of the United States is that we're organized. We're not, we're going to streamline stuff. We're going to like, okay, you know, we probably need to cut out this part because it's too much empty space, blah, blah, blah. We're always improving, but with that comes pressure. And so these differences in the beginning when I was getting culturally adjusted, which I didn't realize as I was getting culturally adjusted, I was, I'd already lived in Brazil for like a year, year and a half, almost two years. It was a process to become culturally um, adjusted, to go through a culture shock cycle, really. Uh, it probably took two or three years to really be culturally adjusted. And the way you know you're culturally adjusted is in the beginning, these differences start to like bother you, mm-hmm. like in your emotions. But now that I feel like I've gone through it, through the cycle of being culturally adjusted, it's like, you know, the differences are there and you have no emotional attachment to it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes like, a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like one person was saying like the, the phases of going through culture shock is in the beginning, you're excited to be on the bus in Brazil, you know, you're like, wow, there's so many people on the bus and you're excited. I'm in Brazil, look at this, they're talking another language and look how sad at these buildings. And then the second step is you start getting annoyed at the differences a little bit. You're like, man, this is really crowded. Like in the United States, the roads are paved better. And, you know, you start feeling like, you start romanticizing how things used to be at, you know, back in your home country and all this kind of stuff. And then in the end, once you've gone through this, the phases, you just get on the bus and you don't think about anything and you don't feel anything. You're just on the bus. <laughs> well, you know what to expect now and it's not so new anymore. Right. There still are times that I've got actually gone back to the United States though. And I've forgotten what is an, a socially acceptable like thing to do. One time we had been talking to this girl. Um, it wasn't even in church. It was like this lady at the mall. Me and my sister-in-law were talking to her for a long time, like 20, 30 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, we had just met her. I didn't know if I was supposed to hug her or not. Or not. I honestly didn't know. Like I wanted to hug her because in Brazil, you would, you would hug her for sure. Mm-hmm. But in the United States, I was like, would that have been weird if I had hugged her? <laughs> and she was kind of like, yeah, that would have been weird. Like I was so, that was such a weird moment for me because I'm like, I'm American. How am I supposed to, how am I lost right now in my own culture? You know? <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah. I could see that's actually a good example. Oh my goodness. Right. And the, 
actually the same with me too, um, because my family is Hispanic. So when you go to visit Puerto Rico, it's kind of the same Hispanic culture that you just literally, you know, kiss each other on both cheeks or whatever and give each other very, you know, big hugs. And there's just a lot more affection, even if you just met that person. So I could definitely understand why you would feel like you know, you get comfortable after a while and then you come back to America and it's not really like that. So (laughs) I've heard working with your spouse can be challenging, but what is it like serving with your spouse as missionaries? And of course, you can be as detailed or diplomatic as you feel comfortable sharing. Um, So you do have a different set of challenges. That's true. But I honestly think that you have a bond that goes even, I feel like it's like a deeper bond because I just imagine like even when, you know, I mentioned earlier about Sister Howe's funeral, just you share experiences through your life, you know, that few others will be able to understand, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, I think it creates a bond. Like I would recommend it to everyone. (laughs) Like, you know, if, if you, if you're worried about it, you honestly don't need to be because I view it as a, as a positive, like you are going to, you're going to have a a very deep bond by serving as missionaries in a different culture, in a different place, in a different language together. And that's what, that's what I believe. I know that there are different challenges you will face, but every marriage has challenges. Yeah. Um, And you have to be ready to battle in the spirit together, especially if you're going to a place that has never had a church together. You got to be ready to pray fast together. And you know, when you do all that together, I mean, I think, I think it's just going to bond you even deeper. Yeah, that's incredible. So what would you say to someone listening who feels that burden to serve as a missionary um, in another country, but they're just having a tough time seeing it actually happen for them? What would you say to that person? Um, I would say start with what's in your hand. And um I've heard a a sermon or a lesson before talking about, you know, Moses, when he was called, God told him, look at what's in your hand right now and throw that down. And um, that's what we all have to do. What's, what is, what can you do right now to start preparing yourself? And if you already know where you're, what region, you know, you're called to be a missionary in maybe, or where you're feeling a tug, you know, I would start studying that language already, get Mm -hmm. ahead of the game on that. I would start giving Bible studies for sure, wherever you are, because we're all called to make disciples, every single person. We're all called to do that. You know, the Great Commission wasn't just for missionaries. It's for everybody to go and make disciples, whether that's on another continent or whether that's, you know, in your school, at your job, wherever that is. We we all should be trying to disciple somebody, you know, and, um, these skills that you'll need as a missionary, you should try to start developing them now because they won't just magically appear by you changing locations. You know, you need to start, what does the Bible say about baptism? What does the Bible say about getting the Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about all these basic doctrines? You know, start studying doctrine right now because if we don't have a doctrinal base, how are we going to go and teach someone else? Um, So I would just say, start with what's in your hands, start now and trust God's timing, trust God's authority in your life. Um, So for everyone that's different, maybe the timing is very soon for you that you're going to go soon. Maybe the timing is in five years, 10 years. I know some people who were called to be missionaries when they were in their fifties, you know, you don't, you don't know when God is going to call you or when that door is going to open, but trust your leadership. If you are, um, if you're married, trust your husband, trust your hus- husband's guidance, because God, if you're, if you're submitted to him, God is going to order your steps. I know, I know he will, he will. And um, trust your pastor. If both of you as a couple already know that that's going to be in your future, trust your leadership as far as your pastor is concerned. Like I said, we knew we wanted to go for, or my husband knew six months, but before that even happened, before we knew anything about Brazil, we were living very, very, very tight on a budget while we were youth pastoring. We were about to leave and we were ready we were, because it was in the middle of the economic crisis. You know, the employment, unemployment was, um, I forget what percentage it was. It was super high 
in California at the time, our one bedroom apartment was super expensive. We lived as cheap as we could and the bills were still barely getting paid. It was like, okay, we got $20 for groceries this week. We got to make this, you know, stretch. And we were ready. Aaron had a job opportunity in another state. We were ready to go. We're like, this makes sense logically, rationally. And we're like, let's talk to pastor about it. And I was honestly worried that I told Aaron, I was like, what if he says no? What if he says we have to stay and we have no money? Like, how are we going to survive? He's like, well, I know, you know, God's either going to speak to him and we're going to obey if he says to stay. Or if he's wrong for some reason, God's still going to bless us no matter what, because we've been submitted. So we went and our pastor did tell us to stay. He told us to stay another year. Mm -hmm. And because we stayed another year though, that's how the door opened for Brazil. If we had already left, who knows what we would be doing right now? Not that we would be like in sin or anything like that, but I mean, we for sure wouldn't be in Brazil. We for sure wouldn't be doing what we are doing. So following your pastor, there is a blessing that comes in submitting yourself, even when it might not even make logical sense, Mm -hmm. but God will honor you. He will. Yeah. I love that advice. And, um, even from, you know, my standpoint with the different, um, you know, ministries I've had on my heart, it doesn't really matter what ministry you have on your heart. If you bring it to the pastor and you listen and obey, God will bless that. Um, I remember being just a little bit confused about you know, even this creative ministry and not sure, you know, writing and art is is just totally different way to express, uh, you know, the Lord and and give him glory. And I remember sitting down and just really talking to Brother Readout and saying, Pastor, I don't know what to do with this. And he really encouraged me to just keep going and keep plugging away. And one thing he said to me that gave me confidence in a way I've never felt before is I believe in you. And I mean, when your pastor believes in you, Mm -hmm. just he sees that he sees your heart and he knows what spiritual battles might come from your decisions. And so you want your pastor to believe in you. And I mean, we have to first believe in our pastors. So I think, I think that is great advice and it can be very, very difficult because we are being led by the spirit or the Lord in, in a particular way. Um, but, Mm -hmm. but we are given a shepherd and uh, I agree. And that's also just something else to really think about too, is you're going to hear opposition from people. You're going to hear all kinds of advice on what you should do from people that may not be called to give you advice and you know it's just a foundation that you can stand on and say yes but my pastor says this right you know and that is just such a reassuring thing I've had some people call me crazy or weird or they're just mm-hmm. confused like why are you doing this and yeah. probably with you why do why Brazil you know you probably right. heard so many things yes. maybe even trying to discourage you mm-hmm. maybe due to ignorance on their part but you could say, right. yes, yeah, but, you know, we have the approval of my pastor and uh, yeah. that's enough for me. Yeah. And in, in today's culture, it's becoming more and more um, just in our culture is moving away from becoming really submitted to your pastor, asking you for your pastor's, you know, thoughts on a big move or a big purchase, you know, anything that's a big change in your life, fewer and fewer people, even in good churches, I'm seeing are making these moves without talking to their pastor. And I think that it's something we really need to get back to is, you know, letting your shepherd, letting your pastor really be your shepherd in your life, not just your preacher. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I think it's just very important to have that covering, especially when you are going to be, you know, a missionary and you're going to be that covering for other people. Right. You know, God is really calling you to be a covering for other people. And I think it's very important that we just keep, everything in line and according to God's, God's ways. Yes, I agree. Well, Tiffany, it really has been a pleasure catching up with you and talking with you. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation, but I want you to take a minute right now to share where everybody can follow the Anderson missionary journey 
on social media and if you can just share where we can give, where they can bless you guys uh, financially. If you have a website, uh, that would be awesome as well if you could just share that. Yes. Well, um, if you want to follow our journey, we have a social media page called Reach Brazil. That's just, that's both on um, Facebook and also on Instagram. And we post, you know, updates, what we're doing in Brazil. It's really our missions page. And also, if you would like to help give to starting the church plan in Sao Paulo to helping, you know, we also use this fund to help feed those who are in need. Um, It's our evangelism fund. It's also been used to help, you know, a couple months ago, another pastor in another church here in our state, he needed another wall for their children's children's church and their children's classes. They needed a wall put up. So we use this evangelism fund to to help with that. There's a lot of things this evangelism fund is used for. But if you'd like to help with that evangelism fund, you can text A Anderson, so A A N D E R S O N to the number 71777. And there should be a link that pops up on your phone. And you can follow that and pick the evangelism tab when it shows what you would like to give to. You can choose the evangelism tab and that would just, that would be such a blessing if you want to donate on that site. Um, that's probably the easiest way to give. If you'd like to, you, if there's another way you prefer to give, you can message me on Reach Brazil um, and we'll get back to you and, and give you other options if you'd like. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for taking the time and being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. I loved our chat. If you found this episode inspiring or helpful, would you take a screenshot of it and share it on your Instagram stories, tagging me at Hello Awesome Ministries? It will encourage me that you were blessed. Also, don't forget to leave a review and subscribe so you can tune into future episodes. To learn more about Hello Awesome, head to helloawesomeministries.com. Until next time, keep your chin up, beautiful.